Okay, hello. Uh, I know that we're a little sensitive on time, um, so I'm just gonna get started. Uh, so my name is Sean Kelly, everyone calls me Stabby. Um, sort of a long, boring story, surprisingly, for a name like that, so I'll skip it. Um, my talk is called Embedding in Go, it sure is weird. On your program notes, it says something like, how I learned to stop complaining and love the strengths of the language, but that doesn't fit very well on slides, so I had to shorten it. Um, so what am I here to talk about? Well, obviously, embedding. Um, what it is and how it works. More accurately, we're gonna cover a lot of ways that it actually doesn't work, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, and we'll talk about some useful ways that you can sort of apply it for fun and profit. However, fun and profit are not guaranteed. Uh, and I also have a lot of really sweet pictures of my awesome dog. Uh, by the end of the talk, you will probably either be sick of seeing the dog or really in love with the dog, uh, depending on how you feel about dogs. Uh, during the talk, I'm gonna make reference to a bunch of different sort of examples in code. Um, it's really hard to sort of accurately reflect code on a display and it's fonts are small and colors and problems. So I have a GitHub repo called uh, embedding talk at savvy.u slash embedding talk. So if you're curious, you can sort of follow along there. Um, I'll kind of casually call out uh, certain examples there sometimes, but you can sort of follow along by going from one to I believe eight. Um, so embedding, it's like inheritance, right? Uh, well, not really. Um, Embedding is not really better than classical inheritance. It's a different tool for a different problem. Uh, that is a quote that I made up that you are free to disagree with. Uh, and if you want to disagree with it, you can feel free to blow me up on Twitter because I'm always on Twitter and I like to talk on Twitter. Um, so let's sort of define what we're talking about here. Um, so embedding is a way to reuse existing structs or interfaces via composition. Uh, and when you do this, you should usually think more about behavior and less about lineage. Um, embedding to define structure is perfectly valid, however. Um, another way to think about this, if you come from a language like Ruby that has these modules that you sort of include uh, with a term they call sideways inheritance, which is less about sort of a straight top to bottom inheritance model and more about gathering a bunch of code that you like and kind of giving it a big hug and grabbing it in sideways. Um, and another way that you can do this is, or that you can use embedding is to sort of define the API of a structure and interface, sort of, sort of gradually build up from first principles um, all the different pieces of the API that you wish to expose. So how does it differ from classical inheritance? Well, like I said, it doesn't really establish or even imply a base slash subclass relationship. Um, when you think about is a versus has a, embedding is has a and not is a. Um, method dispatch in uh, an embedding model mostly works like you would think. However, if you haven't used it too often or if you're coming from a language that has more of that classical inheritance model, um, there's a couple of gotchas that we'll cover that uh, might be surprising and might cause a couple bugs if you don't know to look out for them. Um, specifically, there are some edge cases about where something gets called. So things don't always get called on the struct that you might think they are. Um, and more, an another sort of way that this differs from classical inheritance is that the embedding type, so the type that has another type embedded in it, cannot be exchanged for the embedded type. Uh, so for example, if you had a method that uh, wants a dog, uh, but you have a corgi, and you've embedded the concept of a dog in that corgi, uh, you can't pass in a corgi for a dog. You could still access the dog object on the original corgi, but uh, I'll go over a couple of reasons why you probably don't wanna touch the underlying struct uh, once it's been embedded inside of another struct. So when we talk about classical inheritance, what do we mean? What's, what's sort of a way that you would define a dog through classical inheritance? Well, you would probably use something like the taxonomy chain. A dog is in the kingdom of Animalia, in the phylum of Chordata, it's in the class of Mammalia, it's in the order of Carnivora, the family of Canidae, the genus of Canis, the species of Canis lupus, the subspecies of Canis lupus familiaris, and finally the breed, which is Pembroke Welsh Corgi. And this sort of starts to feel like Java 101 uh, when it comes to inheritance models. Uh, and that's, that's perfectly valid. None of that is incorrect. But another way that you could think about uh, inheritance, or another way that you think about creating objects, is by building them up from the behaviors that you want those objects to have, and not necessarily the lineage that you want that object to have. So for example, if you were to define my dog, which is this dog, who is very lovely and I love him a lot, uh, via the concept of embedding, you might look at it like this. He has a set of radar ears at the top of his head, he has a sniffer, he has a taster, he has two big diggers in the front, and he has two big jumpers in the back, uh, and a very important part of that dog is the wagger all the way in the back so that he can use his behaviors to tell you if he is happy or not. 
And neither of those are incorrect, or rather, I should say, neither of those are more correct than the other. They're just two completely different ways to describe a dog. And you could even go so far as to say that you can combine them, whereas a Canis lupus familiaris is just a Canis lupus that has the domesticated behaviors embedded inside of it. Uh, so as we sort of continue to define what embedding is, uh, as gophers, we're often told to go to the spec, the Go length spec, when we want to find out what something in Go is. Um, well, so the interesting, interesting thing about the spec is, is that it actually now says a lot more than it used to. So when I first gave this talk a couple of months ago, uh, I counted how many times the word embed showed up in the spec. And it only showed up nine times. Nine times is pretty sparse for what is really an important aspect of how you construct things in a language. Uh, but what's interesting is, uh, if you use the Wayback Machine, you can actually see how the spec changes over time. And a month after I gave this talk, they cleared up a bunch of language where they used to refer to embedding by two different terms. One was embedding and one was anonymous types or anonymous fields. Uh, but they got rid of that second definition and now it's all embedding all over the spec and so it's much more consistent and much easier to read. And I'm not gonna take credit for that, um, but kind of I am, so you're welcome. Uh, it probably wasn't me who got that change though. So what does the spec actually say? Well, it says a field declared with a type but no explicit field name is an embedded field. An embedded field must be specified as a type name T or as a pointer to a non-interface type name T, star T. And, and this is important, and we'll cover what this means in a second, T itself may not be a pointer type. And the unqualified type name acts as the field name. And what that means by unqualified is if you have a package P that exposes a type T, P dot T is the fully qualified name, but T is the unqualified name. For interfaces, however, it's a little different. So interface, an interface T may use a possibly qualified interface type name E in place of a method specification. This is called embedding interface E in T. It adds all, ex it adds all exported and non-exported methods of E to interface T. And an interface type T may not embed itself or any other interface type that embeds T recursively. So the interesting thing there is that they, while at the end of this talk you sort of realize that the two different ways of using embedding with structure interfaces are fairly similar, they get described very differently in the spec. And specifically, the spec makes care to call out that you can't recursively embed interfaces. What's also interesting there is that you can't do it with structs either, but the spec doesn't tell you that. The compiler will absolutely stop you dead in your tracks, but the spec sort of makes it open for a question. Um, the spec also defines a series of rules for determining how promotion works. And we'll talk about what promotion means in a second. Uh, but in a lot of ways, it's a little light on examples. And if you look up examples online, you'll see uh, a lot of things around embedding readers and writers, which is interesting, uh, but a little bit basic and not always applicable to everyday uh, writing code. So what is a pointer type? So let's say we go back to that example of building up a dog from the first principles of its behaviors. You might have a struct that is radar ears. Uh, and you can embed that radar ear struct or a pointer to that radar ear struct inside of a corgi and that works fine because it's a pointer to a type and not a pointer type. However, if you were to take that radar ear struct and make another type based off of it that is a pointer to a radar ear struct, you can no longer embed that. And the compiler will give you a pretty clear error that says embedded type cannot be a pointer, which is pretty clear, but it's the way that works is a little confusing and ambiguous, at least when you encounter it at first. It gets even more interesting though when you look at some of the built-in uh, pointer types, for example, slices. So as you continue your career as a programmer who wants to write code for dogs, uh, you might have a set of corgis that you want to keep track of which one is a good dog this day and which one isn't. So you might have a slice of booleans uh, that you want to embed inside of your corgi set. Um, the interesting thing about how promotion uh, works with these types is that things like the index accessors don't get promoted. Only methods and fields get promoted. So right off the bat, this is sort of a bad idea because you can't really do much with that slice anyways. But for the sake of argument, let's say you wanted to try. The interesting thing is that the compiler will give you two different, slightly different errors based on how you do this. If you just try to embed a slice of booleans, it will say syntax error, unexpected bracket, expected a field name or embedded type. So it sort of gives you a little bit of a hint at what you might have been trying to do. However, if you use a pointer to a slice, which by the way you should absolutely never do in any capacity, uh, the compiler will give you a slightly different and shorter error, which is unexpected bracket expecting name. And so it's, it's not as clear there what you did wrong, and so there's a lot of different ways that 
you have to sort of read between the lines or actually go to the spec itself to figure out why this isn't working. <laughs> However, if you absolutely have to do this, there is a way to defeat it. You could make another type that is a good dog list that, ha that is of type slice bool. And you can embed that and the compiler has no problem with it. And, and this is even crazier and you should definitely never do this, if you wanted a pointer to that retype slice of booleans, you can do that too. So there's a lot of ways in which pointer types and pointers to types play together in embedding to make it a little bit confusing to understand what's allowed and what isn't. Um, but typically any type of built-in pointer type you're never gonna be able to embed unless you specifically work around the system to retype it, which again, you probably don't want to do, at least when you're embedding, because you lose a lot of benefit um, of those underlying types. So I've talked about promotion a little bit, um, but there's also two other important concepts, which are selectors and method sets. Uh, selectors and method sets are important in so much as they uh, help define what gets promoted, but they're not necessarily the most important part of embedding. So we're gonna cover them very quickly, uh, but I really wanna talk about promotion. So what are selectors? Well, they're expressions that denote fields or methods available on an object. So basically, uh, the spec defines it as a value, x of type t or star t, where t is not a pointer or interface type, x dot f denotes the field or method at the shallowest depth. And that term shallowest depth is very, very important because when you're dealing with embedding, shallowest depth always wins. And shallowest depth is often sometimes confusing as it sets the context of where the next thing you might try to do actually tries to resolve. Um, if, and if there's such a case where you embed things where there is ambiguity where that shallowest depth is, uh, the selector expression is illegal which can in some cases be a compiler error and can in some cases end up as a runtime error. Uh, for example, a very simple selector would be if you had a struct uh, initialized t, t.f is your basic selector. Method sets are very simply just a collection of all available methods with a receiver of the same type. Uh, and for an interface, it acts as its own method set. Um, and the key word here is set. Method sets can only contain one copy of each thing. And what's even more interesting there is it's not a last right or a first right wins, it's a conflict does not win at all situation. So if you try to embed something where the semantics of promotion make it so that they both have a method X and you wanna promote that method on the embedding struct, uh, it won't be there at all because it's too ambiguous and the runtime will not be able to figure out which one you actually wanna, uh, the compiler on the runtime will not be able to figure out which one you actually mean when you call that method. So promotion, occurs when a type E is embedded into type T. Uh, and I know there's a lot of like single variable types here. This comes directly from the spec. It's not the most engaging way to describe code, but it sort of follows along a line with that, uh, you know, single variable, uh, single letter variable thing that we do in Golang. Um, such that a field or method set, a field or method on E can be accessed at the shallowest depth. Shallowest depth, again, called out very explicitly, of an instance of T. Uh, and if E has a field or a method X and T embeds E, X is promoted if it doesn't already contain X. So if you have a struct that has a method, bark, for example, and you embed another struct that also has a method called bark, uh, the underlying bark, the embedded one, will not be promoted because at the shallowest depth, in this case, which is that top level, that already exists. Promoted methods and fields are also always called on their original receiver. So even though you might have a struct that embeds another struct and promotes up a method, that method is always called on the embedded struct, not on the embedding struct. And that's very, very important when you start to get into things like polymorphism or trying to replicate polymorphism from other languages. Uh, as you're porting code from Ruby or Java or C or whatever to Go, uh, C sharp I should say, to Go, uh, and you run into where you would use inheritance in those languages, where you would try to replace it with embedding in Go, this is probably what's gonna get you uh, the most often. And this, I know that's what got me when I first came to go. Uh, and again, if T already contains X, it's never called on T, it's always called on T and never on E. So it's never going to go beyond that shallowest depth. The first time the runtime finds it is the, is the place where it's always gonna be called. Um, so as a quick example of this, if you had your radar ears and you have a cuteness level on them because dog ears are cute independent of how the dog itself is cute, and you set that cuteness level the underlying embedded value is not changed. It's always gonna be that default value of zero. However, if you explicitly touch into the radar ears and set that cuteness level, their cuteness level will be set 
but the embedding struct's cuteness level will not be set. There's no two-way communication between there. It's only, it's typically only one way, and you shouldn't really try to defeat that because you'll end up in a very confusing situation where sometimes your data is correct and sometimes it isn't. You can also embed multiple structs into a single struct, and this is actually really powerful. Um, you can even nest embeddings. So you can have embeddings that embed, that embed, that embed. You can go all the way down all you want as long as you don't embed the same type more than once or try to have those recursive embeddings that the uh, spec sort of calls out that you shouldn't do or that you can't do. Um, the question is what happens when you embed multiple types that result in ambiguous selectors? Uh, and this is where it gets kind of interesting because the compiler allows you to do this. So if you embed a bunch of types that uh, have ambiguity baked into their promotion semantics, that's okay. But if you then go and try to use any of those values, uh, that's where things will get a little bit ugly and the compiler will stop you. Uh, so if you try to invoke one of those, that will be a compilation failure. But just creating structs that have ambiguity is not a compilation failure. And that's where you can also get into some confusing areas. Um, so for example, if you had, uh, to keep along with the sort of dog theme, if you had two types of corgi, which there are, Pembrokes and Cardigans, and they both have a name, and you could have a method on each one called hello that just says their own name, uh, and then you, in your career, rise to the point where you want to breed dogs yourself, because why wouldn't you? You could then have unlimited dogs. Uh, you might try to then breed a super corgi that has all the best qualities of both types of dogs. When you do that, however, you can now no longer use the hello method because that's an ambiguous selector. So you can embed them, you just can't do anything with them afterwards. Uh, and in addition, you can't also use any of those underlying properties that are also ambiguous. Uh, because again, it's an ambiguous selector and the compiler won't allow ambiguous selectors. You can embed any exported type from any package. You can't embed unexported types from packages that you don't own or, or that are not your current package, obviously, because they're not exported. Um, you cannot embed types from different packages with the same name. So if package T and package P both expose a type that have the same name, you can't embed them both into the same struct. And that's because the unqualified name, the one without the package identifier, is the one that gets used when that struct is created in memory. Um, so the interesting thing is what happens to unexported fields and methods from the exported types? Uh, and there was actually a long-standing bug in the reflect package about this. Uh, and it's actually really interesting if you're interested in embedding and how some of the internals of Go work, and specifically how the decision process to fix things like this work, uh, you should check out uh, issue 4876. Uh, and it was fixed with what I think is one of the most Go ways to fix a problem, uh, which is a comment that says, you shouldn't do this, it's broken as intended. Now what about embedding interfaces in structs? Well, you can do that too. Uh, the idea is that you probably want to think about this in terms of embedding abstract behaviors instead of embedding concrete behaviors. So if you think about embedding a reader or a writer, you're sort of embedding that abstract concept of reading from something or writing to something. Um, there's actually a really interesting trick to this though. Uh, if you have an interface that you embed into a struct and you don't supply a backing implementation to that interface, when you call that method, it will panic with a nil pointer receiver because there's nothing there, it's a nil interface. So if you're going to do this, you need to be very careful how you construct your structs. Um, but what if you wanted to embed two or more interfaces? And specifically, what if they had duplicate methods? So going back to the completely original and not at all getting tired at this point dog example, you might define two different interfaces for a patient dog and a hyper dog. And a patient dog can sit and stay, and a hyper dog can sit, but maybe not for that long. It can also speak or bark. And then in your super corgi, you wanna have both the patient behaviors and the hyper behaviors because now you can sell it to anybody in the whole world who wants either a patient or a hyper dog. And then you might define some methods that will uh, basically invoke those functions. So the sit and the stay function on a Pembroke and the sit and the speak function on a cardigan. And then you might define a method that accepts in those interfaces of a patient and a hyper dog and just sort of does its routine. It either sits and stays or it sits and speaks. Uh, and code's a little bit small here due to resolution size, so I apologize, but I'll sort of just narrate a little bit. Um, what happens is you can no longer use that struct for either interface. And that's because of how promotion semantics work. Because as we talked about with method sets, keyword again being set, and especially where how 
where the conflict resolution of the set works, once you sort of collide those sit methods, now they don't exist on the promoted struct. And so you can't pass it in as an interface, and the compiler will uh, basically yell at you about this, and it will give you two different errors, which is very, very interesting. The first one is uh, that it is, the sit method is ambiguous. Uh, and due to the promotion rules, it does not make it into the method set. So you cannot use star super, cor star super corgi as a patient dog. It does not implement patient dog because it doesn't have the sit method. Uh, and if you try to do it with the uh, other interface as well, uh, it will give you the same error. It will say, this doesn't work, you haven't met the interface because the method is effectively missing even though it did exist on the underlying, uh, underlying interfaces that you embedded. So it gets very, very tricky when you start to embed stuff. So if you're gonna embed interfaces, I would say take a light touch and embed as few as possible because the more that you embed, the greater your risk grows that you'll have those collisions and that they will be usable by nothing. Uh, what's interesting though is that it will still allow you to use uh, as interfaces any of the other methods that might be there. So it doesn't wipe out all the methods that would have been on that interface, only the ones that collided. There's also some really interesting stuff with promotion as to how it relates to marshalling and unmarshalling. Uh, and you can expose and receive data for your embedded types. Uh, there's actually a really interesting change in Go 110, which I am embarrassed to say that we have to look out for in our own code base, uh, where if you embed an unexported type prior to 110, that actually worked and that was fine. Uh, however, with 110, it doesn't work anymore. So you could embed something that wasn't exported into something that was exported and then marshal that object uh, in and out of, say, JSON, and that worked, but it won't work anymore. So don't. Don't do that. Um, you can also add tags to embedded types, and this really changes the behavior of how marshalling works. Uh, it actually changes it in a lot of what I might consider dangerous ways, depending on how you ingest data into your system. Uh, so you should be very careful if you choose to add a struct tag uh, to, another, uh, to an embedded struct. Uh, you can also override and block out the marshalling behavior of embedded types. And this actually gets really, really interesting uh, when you think about APIs and how you send data and receive data to the front. Uh, I actually have a lot of examples in that uh, repo that's linked at the bottom of my slides. Uh, they get kind of complicated and I could basically give a 20 to 30 minute talk on just any one of those examples. Uh, but I'm gonna cover very briefly one of them on my next, uh, my next slide. But I would say check that out um, if you're really interested in some of those edge cases because there's a lot of them and there's a lot of different ways you could choose to structure this. And so you need to be very, very careful. Um, so the one example that I wanna talk about is hiding secrets. So a very common thing that you might have is a domain model, like a user, for example, uh, and you wanna send that to the front of your API. And you don't necessarily wanna have like a bunch of duplicate models that you have to maintain. You add a field to one, you gotta add a field to, to another. It kind of becomes a maintenance burden. So what we like to do, at least where I work, uh, we like to embed our domain models in what we call view models, or you might also think of them as type requests. Um, you can use promotion semantics to hide private information. So say you have a secret on a user object or a password, which hopefully you have hashed and are not soaring in the clear. Uh, you can hide those if you're careful, but you need to watch out for some tricky behaviors with regard to tags on embedded fields. Um, also, the shape of the data that you ingest makes a difference here. So with embedding, you can ingest data that looks like the uh, embedded types, or you can ingest data that looks like the promoted type. So everything sits at the top level versus everything sits at an, a nesting of embeddings. Uh, and both of those work depending on what you want to do, but you really need to understand uh, what your ultimate uh, end goal is with receiving that data. So I do have a bunch of examples around there. Specifically check out uh, in that repo seven marshalling slash tags for examples of this. Um, the TLDR of this is don't rely on hyphen to ignore embedded secrets redefine the field and use the same struct tag name and include omit empty or else it will not be omitted and you will be sending potentially sensitive data to your front end uh, and you never, never want to do that. Um, so to sort of summarize some of the stuff that we're talking about here, uh, that's also a picture of my awesome cat. So I wanted to trick everybody. It's not just dog pictures, it's also a cool cat picture. Um, embedding, uh, it's not better than inheritance. It's just different. Uh, the spec has been updated recently to include a lot more context, so definitely, while you should always be checking out the spec, uh, it's, got, it's, it's never been more clear as to how embedding works with how it's worded now. Um, selectors and method sets are actually really simple if you think about them, but promotion is where it gets really tricky. Promotion is the thing that you have to really keep in mind. Uh, 
Uh, and you can also embed interfaces, but it gets pretty weird, so do it if you need to, but don't do it all the time. Um, methods and fields are always called relative to their original receiver. Once you go down, so down into an embedded type, you can never go back up. It will never start the next method lookup or method dispatch from the top down. It will start from where you are and it will go sideways or further down. So be very, very careful with how you think this is, uh, how you think your method dispatch is gonna work because it might not work like you think. Uh, and once you embed a value, you probably shouldn't ever touch it again uh, because it's not gonna communicate back up to the promoted values. Uh, you should only interact with embedded types via their promotions exposed by the embedding type. Uh, or you could just throw a caution to the wind uh, because I'm not the go police, that's Bill. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm like 35, six, seven seconds over now, so I don't know if we have time for questions, but if you wanna yell at me or tell me that I was wrong about something, um, I'm sitting in the front row, so please feel free to come by and do that. Thank you. Yeah, we can take one or two questions. Oh, okay. Uh, hi. Sorry about that. Uh, when would I actually use, uh, uh, when would I actually embed interfaces in my stuff? It, it, it seemed like a way to constrain uh, behavior for my stuff. Yeah. So the question is, when would I actually choose to embed interfaces in my struct? Um, I, honestly, I don't really see this very often in the wild. I often see interfaces embedded into other interfaces, so you're sort of building up a larger interface from smaller pieces, but you still want those smaller pieces to be used independently. Um, embedding interface in structs is a little weird. Uh, I, I covered it here not as a uh, way to promote its use, but as a way to sort of cover that you could do it. Um, I think some of the simpler ways that you could think about when to use it would be, I mean, those reader-writer examples where you might want a struct that can, you know, sort of manage reading and writing itself and be passed around as a reader-writer. Uh, Basically, anytime you can think of like, I want this struct to have an abstract set of behaviors, but a common interface is probably where you might want to choose to do that. Um, but personally, I don't think I've ever seen it in the code that I've worked on professionally. Okay. Do we have any more questions? Cool. Uh, thanks, Sean. That was an awesome talk. Uh, your laptop.